Hit me. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. The podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. And now, your host, Dustin Jones. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Senior Rehab Podcast. Thank you for your time today. I am very excited for you to meet today's guest. You probably already know him. He goes by the name of Kelly Starrett. He is a coach, a physio, author, speaker, and a co-creator of MobilityWide.com. He's the author of Becoming a Supple Leopard, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. He's also written Ready to Run, Unlock Your Potential to Run Naturally. Also, Deskbound, Sitting is a New Smoking. He's worked with Olympians, professional athletes, and elite military personnel. He's been featured on Men's Health, ESPN, Fox News, 60 Minutes, and the show all of us geriatric PTs watch with our patients at 11 a.m. every morning, The View. However, he has now reached the pinnacle of his career as the next Senior Rehab Podcast guest. Kelly, I hope you sense that sarcasm. Welcome to the show. I'm so (laughs) pleased that you pulled in The View into all of this. That's so good. That's so good. Because anytime you're in an elevator with Whoopi Goldberg, oh my you know gosh. it's real. It's real. Yeah. I, I mean, that that was absolutely, I mean, out of all the spots that you've done, man, The View, I mean, that's that's huge. And those are my people. So I, I love I love those ladies on The View. So good work with well, that. It turns out there, there are people, all of us mm. have people on The View. It's true. <laughs> so I want to start with a story. I, I've not told you this story. Um, I, I know you're very aware, you know, of the massive impact that your books, your teaching has had on, you know, probably millions of people in terms of their health. But did you know your book has also had an impact on marriages? Oh, you know, I did know it has had an impact on marriages and sometimes not in a healthy way. <laughs> so, so let me uh, give some specifics. So Jacob actually, he's a good friend. He actually kicked off my my beautiful wife's wedding ceremony by quoting Becoming a Supple Leopard. So I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm going to read you this. <laughs> the third problem with our current thinking is that it continues to be based on a model that prioritizes task completion above everything else. It's a sort of one or zero, task done or not, weight lifted or not, distance swam or not mentality. This is like saying I deadlifted 500 pounds, but I herniated a disc or I finished a marathon, but now I have plantar fasciitis and wore a hole in my knee. Imagine this sort of ethic spilling over into the other aspects of your life. Hey, I made you some toast, but I burned down the house, end quote. And he referenced that in the issue of couples focusing so much on on the wedding feast and not the actual marriage. So you've helped my squat. You've also helped my marriage. I appreciate it. Oh, I love it. No, that's, (laughs) I don't know what to say other than, you know, the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. And I I think this, that really does ultimately frame the conversation you and I should be having today, which is what we call the long game. Yeah. (laughs) And, and unfortunately, one of my good physician friends says this all the time. He's like, Hey, look, Chances are you're going to outlive your gonads, but not outlive your knees. You're going to be you're going to be 110. And you, better, you better plan for that. And I, I know, and we're we're you know we're living in this you know immediate self gratification model. And what ends up happening is we don't we can't see because of the miraculous design of the body mm. and how robust we are. We, it's difficult for to, us to understand the decisions that we're making today in terms of the implications on our quality of life and our, on our range of motion, our mobility, our desire to move, mm. our, our energy, all of those things. And, you know, we have to be making sure that we are committed to daily process. We have a movement practice that we are doing just the little things every day and, and, and showing people how they can integrate this into our lives. So mm. it's not some big heroic effort. You know, we, we say this all the time. We'd much rather you be consistent than be heroic. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And that, that is not always, preached uh, and then the the common masses and I appreciate you know you and your team doing that um but I want to I want to kind of dig into uh just your career and you know you're a very accomplished physio and coach but I'm interested as as a physiotherapist what settings have you worked in or even rotated through while you were in school just to I just want to get an idea of, of where you've been 
Well, what's interesting is, um, you know, I was lucky enough that I went to a very heavy manual school. It was a Maitland-based school. Okay. And we also had a heavy-duty, well-accomplished neurologic part. So we were attached to the World Center for PNF at Kaiser Vallejo. Wow. And those senior senior teachers there, you know, the senior rehab staff there were our daily instructors. And that really does inform your thinking as a student about – how do these things scale? Can I, <clears throat> can I tell a story about improving shoulder function and improving how someone sits and stands or you know, works at the edge of a bed? And <clears throat> one of the interesting things was, ironically, and probably you know, the way the, the world works, I spent more time working with deconditioned people in skilled nursing facilities and, and TCU facilities and cardiac rehab than anyone else in my class, which is really, really Why I'm is great. That? I don't know, just the, the luck of the cards, okay. the way it worked out. But um, I'm really grateful that I spent so much time thinking about or being forced to think about as a student, you know, not how do I rehab this ACL, right. but, you know, how am I going to help this person get dressed? How... Do we solve this problem of getting up off the ground independently? How do we think about that? And it really forced me to stretch what I already understood about you know, strength and conditioning and, and the higher limits of sports and performance to make sure that I could you know, connect the dots mm. between why we do Turkish get-ups and why it's important that we have strength to be able to get up off the ground or even the range of motion to get up off the ground. And it really did inform ultimately how we think about universalism and the universal application of movement. So, because when you when you suddenly scale, you take this big view back, mm -hmm. and you, we look at the world the way it is. You know, one of the reasons that people end up in nursing homes or skilled care facilities is they can't get up off the ground independently. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're like, well, hey, you know, this great piece of research came out that said the number of points of contact that you use to be able to get up off the ground is a good indicator of early mortality. Yeah. You know, and then you're like, well, I guess I got to be strong and I, my hips need to work. You know? <laughs> and, and, and then suddenly when you look at cultures that toilet on the ground and sleep on the ground, we see lower rates of lumbar disease, mm -hmm. lower rates of, of um, hip disease. And the other th interesting thing is that fall rates in the elderly start to approximate zero. If you sleep, get up off the ground every day to get up and sleep and toilet, you just don't fall over very much or you fall less. Mm. And I think – what we need to do as movement professionals is be asking ourselves, well, what are, is the movement habitus? Because, you know, as Juliet and I have, my wife and I have thought critically about sort of the, some of the higher levels of performance, we've come more and more back into, the, into this reasonable background of saying, hey, look, on a day-to-day -day basis, does you, are you taking your body through its normal ranges of motion? Are you involved in movements that ask you to do things like put your arm over your head every day? Mm. And suddenly when you, when you take that view, you can understand why movement programs and movement practices like yoga and Pilates are so vital or how genius Qigong is, yeah. right? I'm connected and my feet have to be strong and I have to be really develop proprioceptive you know, capacities. But also we've come to realize that non-exercise activity – is really the keystone to function. Mm. And, and as you know, if you've worked in the hospital with people at home, you know, a couple days in the bed and you, pull, you lose some tolerance quickly yeah. to, to manage, manage your blood pressure and gravity. And so you know, we have to make sure that we can scale these things and then at the higher limits so that when we have well populations – Right. Mm -hmm. they, these are the, still the people who have the patina of age on them. Right. We have some, you know, some joint creakiness and less tissue tolerance for silly BS, you know, that we can still understand why we're teaching box squatting and goblet squatting yeah. and why we still work on things like can you get up off the ground and and sit to roll. I mean, just some really, really simple things. And what ends, what ends up happening in our worldview is that it's suddenly very easy to say, in this high level of strength and conditioning, we can take out and cherry pick and prune down what we think are really simple practices mm -hmm. that people should be doing together as a family anyway. Yeah. So, oh. so let's, let's take that to, uh, say that skilled nursing facility, you know, where you rotated through when you, you say those simple practices, uh, what give us some practical advice in that setting. So let's say if you were to go back to that, that 
you know, sniff today, what would you make sure that you do with all your patients considering, you know, if it, if it wasn't contraindicated? Well, you know, is breathing contraindicated? Because what I can tell you is that as a student, you know, I'd walk into a hospital room or see someone after surgery and there was that little puff thing, you know, and you're like, you know, just hit that little ball. And, and I can't <laughs> tell you that that was never made that important to me. Yeah, it's, you know why? Because <clears throat> pneumonia is a drag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we don't talk about is that if I don't have good ventilatory excursion and if I don't have good mechanical ventilation efficiency, I can't circulate lymph through my, my trunk. You know, I'm going to see downregulation in, you know, in, in, in my parasympathetic, sympathetic tone. Mm-hmm. You know, I, my total, you know, how, how I ventilate, I end up being shallow. That has implications on blood pH. And what I could tell you is that, well, boy, everyone in my, that I would see, I would be like, I, the first five or 10 minutes of what we would do would be massive, massive work on diaphragmatic breathing. Mm. And, and because you know why? That's not skilled care. That's me saying, this is what I expect. I would pull in every, every parent, every you know, child. I'd be like, this is what we're going to do here. This is what I expect you to do two or three times a day. And it maybe it's being 20 or 30 big breaths, yeah. you know, <clears throat> and then repeating that cycle every 20 or 30, you know, every, you know, for two or three minutes. But what I, what I didn't understand is how important and the implications of, you know, vagal tone, breathing through the diaphragm, mobilization of lymphs, right? Mm -hmm. Oxygenation. I mean, you know, how many times I put a nasal cannula on someone and not look at their, how efficient they were, their respiration or, or looking that as, as a, as a limiting rate limiter to them being able to stand. Um, you know, I think that in retrospect, you know, and I, I did some small experiments. I had, I have a lot of physicians who train at our gym Mm -hmm. and one of my interns, uh, he's an medical an internist, I was like, hey, could you do me an experiment? Just do an experiment with me because I don't think it's a skill. You don't need a physio, but you know, set someone up in the chair and then block them and you know, make it so they can't sit or can't fall down, but make them perform five squats every minute for the, and then take a rest and then do it until they're blown out. Yeah. And, and you know what he said was that you know, he could assign that to his nursing staff because it was non-skilled. And, and if people failed, they failed into the chair, right? Mm, yeah. Right. It was, you know, we didn't have to move. We didn't have to transfer. We just, you know, but, you know, what we saw was that a lot, I saw a lot of people failure to thrive because they're, they were already at the margins of their conditioning. Yeah. And then the onset rapid deconditioning kicked in. And we, I, as a physical therapist student, I didn't realize that I had, you know, that we could have done a hundred bridges for time every day. Yeah. We could have done much more active sit to stand or just sits or, you know, and I could have scaled that. And, you know, what he saw was that his patients where he assigned squats and he'd be like, he would literally be like Tabata squat, four rounds, right? Or eight mm-hmm. rounds of Tabata squat. Mm-hmm. And his nursing staff would be like, what's Tabata squats? And he'd be like, look it up. <laughs> and they'd be like, so these people would do one squat every 20 seconds, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, for eight minutes and they'd be cooked, mm-hmm. but they didn't need, they, that wasn't skilled intervention. And then when people needed to ambulate to go home, turns out, of course, they had better function, better balance, better respiratory, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I sometimes think by the time we get people up out of bed and, you know, we've moved all the, the furniture around and, and unhooked everything and, you know, and we've taken three steps, we could have done twice as much work mm-hmm. from a sit to stand, twice as much work at the edge of the bed, twice as much work in the bed. And we could have added these breathing practices and all of a sudden had a much bigger conditioning ventilation impact without all of the trappings of ambulating. And not that we don't need to do that so that people can go home, but I think there's a lot more work we could hand off to a non-skilled agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I would agree with that uh, for sure, especially given just kind of my background, especially coming into to home health, because I was kind of in the sports fitness arena. I was teaching kettlebell classes, and and I had that that similar view of programming and kind of implemented that in, into the home health sessions. And I mean, my gosh, the, the conditioning uh, benefits are just through the roof. But what I found was that my sessions kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter, almost to the point where my uh, supervisor was, you know, kind of questioning, like, are you sure we can bill for this if, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in terms of time? But, but the, the value that you can pack in such a smaller period of time is huge if you implement some of these things that you just mentioned. And that, I mean, that just, 
it makes me think of, you know, your work, you know, in the CrossFit realm. I mean, my gosh, the implications of, of what you do in that gym for people like me that work in home health or someone in SNF or acute care is, is pretty massive, I think. Well, you know, I, I think that the issue is that we, we can't always see the universal application. So what are the things that people are going to do when they get home? They're going to have to s- squat to the chair, to the toilet, right. to the bed, you know, and do we have the range of motion to do that? <laughs> you know, do we, do we have even, are we even spending any time in those shapes? And then we can show people how it's an easy way. You know, we, um, let me give you an example. I had a really deconditioned woman with really bad knees, you know, I'm just gonna put that in quotation marks because every knee is not bad. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes we do this sneaky, you know, building protocol. I'm like, oh, here's what you got to do today. You got to do one squat, just one. <laughs> and tomorrow you got to do two. Yeah. And then the next day you got to do three. And then, ha- and I'm like, you know, and have, have your daughter text me when you've done five. And then, and pretty soon in two weeks, it's 15 squats. And in a month, we're at 30 a day. Mm. And, you know, that creeping overload, you know, really gives people a chance to be comfortable, feel safe. But what does it say about us that, you know, people are going about their lives and, you know, and are, are so deconditioned that, you know, we're, we're wall walking that, you know, it's, it's, I think it's shocking. I think we, we put, you know, this is a good example. My, my mother-in-law her is married to um, like um, was remarried, and his mom came to live near them, and she was in a very traditional home health care situation and was pretty sedentary, and she needed a walker, and she's ninety five. Mm-hmm. When she came here, it turns out that her bedroom was down the hall from the elevator, and the amount of walking that she had to do to get to the you know with her literally. This woman now transfers independently, pops up, doesn't hold on to stuff. She is just a tank. That's and I'm awesome. like, I'm, and I, so it's sort of awesome, but I'm afraid she's going to be another 110, 100 <laughs> year old, you know, and, and, and her whole system changed because her, she was interested, you know, she felt better. She had more energy, you know, she, you know, I, I don't think we're, we sometimes understand or give due credence to the the issue that as human beings, we are designed to move, period. And that holds true whether I'm a child at a desk at a school or I'm an adult who needs to work, walk around more and not sit as much or you know, my grandparents making sure that they're engaged in activities that look like specific training yeah. and non-exercise activity. And what ends up happening, as we know, is that we start to winnow those windows down of functionality right. and pretty soon a walk down to the hallway or transfer becomes a, is, is seemingly insurmountable. But as you know, working at home, you know, this is the place where we've got to get capture people's imagination that we don't need, you know, getting up off of the couch is not a skilled intervention, mm. you know, and holding on to the side of your, you know, home bed and having a wheelchair locked behind you and using your arms to stand up over and over again for 10 or 15 so you can learn how to squat safely. Mm -hmm. That looks like the same squat we use when we're rehabbing ACLs, right? Yeah. And it's, and and it's a continuum. And I really, we just want people to understand that, you know, this is a continuum and yes, you know, I appreciate that, you know, all of the manual muscle, you know, contact P and F cues that I would do sitting just to get people's trunk musculature on, you know, hold, don't let me move you, put your arms above your head, now let's see if you can sit at the edge of the bed. I just think when we give people the keys to the castle and they and show them how much better they feel and how much more function they can get, mm-hmm. we don't have to sell them on anything ever again. Yeah. Yeah, and it, you mentioned that word continuum and and that's something that's been really helpful for me. Uh, just, you know, reading your stuff, coming into home health uh, cuz you know, in in the fitness world, you know, like if you're if you're going to throw around some heavy weight, you know, you want to make sure that you're you're doing things well. That you know you're in a good position. You've got the right range of motion to do the movement, um, and and that's almost that's a prerequisite. But what I found when working with older adults, you know, a lot of times, you know, those those patients may not have the prereqs to do a certain movement, but they can achieve it. Uh, I feel like if it's within kind of like a zone of tolerance to where, you know, they're not causing, you know, too much damage or or having any pain, um, 
What, what are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, just, you know, because you're working with very, very high level elite performers. Well, let me stop you there because yep. at right. our, we, do, we do see all of that, but we also have master's classes at our gyms mm-hmm. with, you know, people with multiple total hip replacements and knee replacements. And, you know, and what we realize is that, hey, look, he, we know, I mean, just open Norkin and White, yeah. understand what needs, to, these are the things that all human beings should be able to do, even within a standard deviation. You're putting your arms over your head is not within functional limits. That's what human beings are supposed to be able to do. And at mm-hmm. some point, at no point should that basic capacity go away to be able to flex your knee. Yeah. But it does. And we get injured and we get behind and we take our eyes off it because we're doing other things. So what we end up doing is keep people in pain-free ranges, big time. Yeah. And just because you should be able to squat butt to ankle all the time, right? Like you're taking a poop in the woods, mm-hmm. doesn't mean that everyone can do that well or safely. So that means that, hey, on our way to reclaim function, we always start with the idea of saying, hey, look, this is not good or bad. It's just complete or incomplete. And your body may ultimately set a set of parameters for incomplete or complete rather Mm. by just saying, hey, look, you may never get hip crease below the knee because when you squat because of the fact that, you know, your hips or have had some bony changes and, you know, there might be, you know, arthritis, you know, the joints. But it doesn't excuse you from the fact that you're going to need to be able to get up off the ground, you know, get off the seat, get off the chair, get out of the car and that's a lot of range of motion. So let's make sure we own what's available to us instead of saying, well, I can't do the whole thing. Let's do part of it. Mm. What people don't understand also is that you know, motion is lotion, you know, big time. And the things that I've seen on joints that are, look like garbage dumps, you know, I mean really like heroic <laughs> efforts yeah. on inside of you know, trash can knees, trash can hips <laughs> – makes me think that these systems are pretty robust but just may be disused. Oh, yeah. and, and you know one of the big magics here is to think, hey, you know we can apply a lot of different strategy to this fundamental body positions and, and lowering your center of gravity and maintaining an integrity of your spine is called squatting and it's a fundamental position. hip hinging is a vital skill. but we can do things like tempo. So suddenly I'm just saying, hey, we're just going to slow that descent down so that you can own it. You can be aware. You don't surprise those painful ranges. We, you know, we work on a ton of eccentric load. You know, there's just so many ways that we, you know, what happens if I have you breathe hard a little bit? We're going to just go for a walk yeah. and then we're going to squat. Oh, that's timed up and go. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, wait a minute. That's the same skills that we use for uh, uh, one of the most brutal strength training pieces we have ever done, which was popularized by a hammer thrower from Russia named Litvinov, mm. who basically was like, hey, look, he front squatted 200 kilos for seven reps. And by the way, that's freakish. <laughs> then he ran 400 meters. And then he repeated that whole thing four or five times. And what I love about the timed up and go and then the Litvinov squat run protocol is those are just scaled iterations of the same thing. Mm, I, need to be, I need to be able to ambulate and I need to be able to fold my hips until I sit down to the ground. And those are the, those are the same. So you know, there's a lot of ways where we can challenge our capacities there. You know, and you know, maybe I have to stand and put my arms over my head, then I squat down, and then poof, that's just changing motor motor control. And so instead of block practice, now I have random practice. Yeah. And there's there's so many ways to put a weight vest on someone, have them hold of you know a, a one pound weight. I, there's just it's infinite, and we're only limited by our own creativity here. Mm-hmm. But what we can unequivocally say is here's what the body is supposed to do. Are we doing it? Yes or no? Yeah. I know a lot of listeners, uh, you know, that are in the sniff acute care home health, uh, are, are really excited after you dropped all those ideas because it's so easy to kind of get in that rut, get in the routine. And for a lot of, a lot of us, we haven't been exposed to, to your world that you spend a lot of your time in, but man, there's so much that, that we can learn from either side, uh, you know, from the elite performance to, you know, just kind of the other settings of PT. So that, that was awesome. Well- you know, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that the job is difficult. You know, I'm thinking of a, a man who had these huge, you know, venous ulcers, oh. you know, on his legs. And, you know, we were wrapping with a proform boot, you know, every day. And, 
and you know wound care was part of this guy's you know lie and we had you know huge pitting and and you know the, as he was sitting there how could he possibly get move the edema out of his legs you know by putting a proform boot on there we were able to compress it so it didn't swell right mm-hmm. but the bottom line is unless we have muscle contraction how could we possibly get lymphatic drainage and improve the quality of the health so suddenly you're thinking well well, what can this guy do sitting? Could he have pedaled on a bike? Yeah. Is there, you know, in a, just a, you know, a simple, like, you know, <clears throat> not even a bike, but just a, you know, a, a pedal chair. I mean, explaining the physiology to it, you know, I, I just thought, man, I failed that guy because I was a student and I wasn't clever enough to understand to show him what he could have done. Cause you know, he didn't, he didn't like having those boots on and, right. and, and wound care was a big part of his life. And that was not a very, you know, fantastic part of his life. Yeah. Not fun. So I'm interested uh, in in your work, you know, kind of in that CrossFit world. You know, you were you were on from from the beginning, it seemed. Uh, you know, with with that San Francisco affiliate. I wonder, you know, just getting more experience with some of these older individuals that are training in that CrossFit system. How has that changed your perception of aging? Well, you know, what I think is that our our notions of what we're capable of. Are maybe skewed towards a little bit um, too restricted, you know. Yeah. And al- also, you know, what I would say is that, you know, we we make a lot of mistakes as young people because we can get away with things. You know, you always walk in, you touch your toe. I mean, literally, when I was sixteen and throwing the shot put in high school, I would tell my coach, you know, I, I'm pre stretch coach. Like, what do you want me to do? Like. <laughs> I don't need to warm up. Like, you know, this is wasting my time, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden I'm 43 and I'm, you know, if I don't break into a sweat before I begin to train, you know, things don't go as great for me. I'm a little stiffer the next day. You know, my knees, you ain't no are spring little, chicken. You know, that's what my grandma I'm, would say. I'm, I'm less springy. <laughs> so what, what that does though, is it, it influences the way we think about all people. And so, you know, a lot of times, one of the first things that we do for, for people who, you know, aren't 20s and, you know, in young 30s is we say, hey, look, we're going to remove some of the speed from your situation. Mm-hmm. So instead of power cleans, we're going to front squat. Mm-hmm. Instead of front squat, we're going to goblet squat instead of, you know, yeah. and in between, we're going to do a lot more cardiorespiratory work. And so, you know, for example, my wife and I, the, the only time we only just lift is when we deadlift because it's so taxing and you know, and that's about for me, that's the only time I just do one thing and then I do some accessories. Yeah. Every other time I touch a weight, every other time, there is a big cardiorespiratory piece in between. So if I'm floor pressing, I row a thousand meters between sets. Yeah. You know, or if I'm squatting, I have to jump on the bike and, you know, and ride three to five minutes or get my heart rate X. Or and what we find is that those protocols with our older athletes allows us to make sure we're deeply warmed up and that we see that we don't have to put our athletes under the loads that we thought we did. We can get a lot of work done between 70 and 85% of one rep max instead of living in that 90 to 100 one print reps where my, where my athletes positions may be slightly compromised, where their tissue tolerance is good. And what I'll do is I'll just work on more volume. So just like we train with kids, we don't put children under loads immediately and just keep loading up. We add volume and then we challenge that volume with cardiorespiratory demand, mm-hmm. which keeps everyone's ego in check because the last time I checked, everyone has an ego when they go to the gym. You know, we, all, <laughs> we all like to gain. You know? and, yeah. and I think what's interesting now is that the conversations become more nuanced, that we have a lot of um, you know, at master's athletes who train with us. And the training is the same. It's just scaled variations. You know, we don't ask some of our older athletes to do muscle ups because, you know, we can get the same stimulus from really strict dips mm-hmm. and strict pull ups. And we don't have to load those incomplete mechanics or challenge or patina shoulders with the same dynamic, you know, load with and still get 90% of the effect or 95% of the effect. Yeah. I, I want to go back a little bit. Did you say, you work out with your wife? Uh, my Juliet is uh, the bane of my training existence. <laughs> That's she, impressive. You, she you is, work out uh, and you're still well, together. 
Well, actually not. You know, one of the things that I think we we could do a better job of mm-hmm. is training together. Yeah. And when we see cultures that train together, I'm like, I'm talking about um, like businesses and, you know, for us, for Juliet and I, it's a time where we get to spend time together and the gym or the training environment is so egalitarian. It's so equalizing, you know, because – Maybe Juliet uses larger loads than I do, but I do more cardio than she does. <laughs> I hope you know? she gave you a look when you said that. No, she's a two-time world champion and uh, honestly the greatest training partner I've ever had. And one of the nice things about that is was we try to cr- help people create systems. What we have found is that the training environment and the training culture mm-hmm. really does matter. And that small group training – this is a good example – in our, in our house, we have a pretty decked out garage. It's our garage gym. And then we also have another outdoor training space in our little corporation yard in our house. But we have about 10 neighbors who come over and all train together in the morning. That's awesome. And you know what ends up happening is we know is that training partners, workout partners, fitness partners, exercise partners, walk in the mall, getting a cup of coffee partner, all of that matters because it holds us accountable and keeps us from sliding into entropy. And also it helps us measure our progress via other people. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that, that you know, the allegory of me training with my wife is, is exactly what we should be doing and helping people not be you know, islands of lone wolf doing air squats <laughs> you know, at home. Like, that's terrible. Like, yeah. We need – especially in home health, I think there's an opportunity for fellowship and companionship that sometimes we don't see – and you know, having a physio show up at your house is great, inter- you know, intervention. But you know, what if you know parents came over, or kids came over, or grandchildren came over, and, and that was part of the process? I think we'd see far better adherence and 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 excitement about what we were trying to do. Yeah, and it makes me think of the the glory days of skilled nursing facilities when you you could do group therapy and you mm-hmm. could bill it, and and you know the rules changed and the incentives shifted to that one on one. Uh, therapy with the different rug levels. And, you know, I, I wasn't working at, in SNFs, you know, when there was group therapy, but when I would talk to therapists, I mean, those were the glory days, you know, just getting people together, you know, they would have a ball, you know, do all kinds of different stuff. It was very interactive and engaging, uh, you know, physically, but then, you know, mentally as well. So, I, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you. Well, and, you know, and, and continuing to advocate for, you know, there's, and I was just down in Southern California and I saw a yoga class happening in this park and there were a hundred people doing yoga together. And, and, you know, yoga can be scaled. So it's appropriate for everyone. But my, my mother-in-law and her husband go do Qigong once a week, you know, at the, at the local high school and, you know, 60 people or 70 people show up That's awesome. and, and they begin to create a community. And even in, we've seen in our own master's athletes class, I mean, these women and men show up and they all can, can relate to each other and it's not – you know, and, and, the, and the young whippersnappers, i.e. the rest of us, are running around doing our stuff around them. Mm-hmm. But they also can see there's a continuum that, that, that what they're doing isn't some light version. It's just the appropriate version and iteration of the things that everyone else needs to do. Yeah. And, but that the fact that they belong to each other and they show up and they, you know, and they develop this relationship is the crucial piece to this. And I think – if there's you know something that we could do a better job of is is you know putting the fun putting the connection putting the team putting the tribe back into you know the human human being because we are we are social animals and this physical practice non-exercise activity happens best and so let me give you an example um, my wife and I as you know um, have spent some time really trying to work on resolving some of the problems around sedentary lifestyle in school-age children. And we have a nonprofit called Stand Up Kids, and which is trying to convert traditional sitting desks into what we call fidget desks or moving desks. So where kids have bars that swing underneath the desk and they can move and fidget and have all these have these you know chances to move in the environment. But one of the things we realized, you know, that's great, but we saw another opportunity and Juliet had the idea of creating a walking school bus. And so now, so now we have every morning, you know, it's a little over a mile to school and kids, parents drop their kids off at the corner and about 20 to 40 of us on any given day walk to school. And for a lot of parents now, what we're seeing is that those parents have begun 
to walk and develop relationships and they to chat. And so there's a five kilometer walk almost built in every morning for these adults routines. And what we've talked to in the course of this, we, we understand that a lot of what we do, we are what we call serial, you know, you know, empiricists of anecdotes, right? I mean, it's yeah. anecdote of one, N of one, mm. but suddenly I have an N of 10, you know, an N of 20, but it's really N of one of 20. And people are saying, hey, look, you know, hey, I, since I started this walking school, school bus this year, I lost 10 pounds. Um, I have more energy. My wife and I actually started going to the gym together because we, we liked how we felt. You know, people have yes. reported that they sleep better. And all we did was create a situation where all they had to do was walk to school with their kids. Yeah, and that's, you know, the human being, as you know, and anyone who works at home health knows, is literally like a dry sponge. And when you just push that sponge down, mm. it soaks up and is looking for homeostasis. And I think that's what's so remarkable about the world that we live in is that when we take these best principles, you know, overload, pro, you know, progressive overload, you know, said principle, right. and we just get people to train a little harder, breathe a little harder, move a little more, the body just responds in kind in so many ways. Yeah. And it's much easier to get to 80% and much harder to dial in the last 20%. But if we just got to 80%, man, you know, what would happen? You know, if, if you're more insulin sensitive, you know, what happens to the, your drug load? You know, if, if, you're, if you move more, then you have better gut health and you actually absorb your food and your drugs differently. I mean, the, the downstream implications of this are, are profound and astounding. Yeah. And that, that makes me appreciate people like, uh, Mike Eisenhart, uh, with, you know, free the yoke and, and just starting or really bringing that, that conversation to our profession and you as well, you know, just kind of taking a step back that 30,000 foot view on how we can have, you know, a big impact beyond the clinic for sure. But I'm, I'm curious what, um, in our field PT, what are you excited about in terms of, you know, what's going on right now or the, where do you see our profession going? What, what, what gets your blood pumping a little bit? Uh, you know, I think it's really a good time for our profession in a way that we maybe haven't seen in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. I think that we're realizing that we need to deliver care, skilled care differently than I wait around for people to get injured and sick and then try to have meaningful change behaviors in 30 minute interventions yeah. every two weeks. My gosh. You know, I just don't, I don't think that that's how it works. Um, I think that suddenly we have real opportunities to become allies for people who are actually delivering healthcare, which are coaches and trainers and teachers. Mm. You know, where, who are the people that are spending the most time with people and actually delivering fitness and wellness? And why aren't we working harder to be those people ourselves and pivot to support those people? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we're getting to the place where we could actually say, hey, we have some movement vital signs now. And here's a reason to come see your physio, even when things aren't going well or things are going well. Um, I think we're moving away from purely evidence-based practice to, hey, what is clinical-based practice? And what are these movement traditions that, you know, that don't need science because we have logic and observation, right? And, you know, we don't do I have to prove scientifically that human beings are runners and we need to run? That's ridiculous. Do you know how, you know, so what I think is happening now is, you know, we're seeing that the physio education potentially sets us up for a very, very interesting specialization of being experts in how people move and optimizing function and not necessarily only addressing pain and dysfunction. Yeah. Because what, what we're trying to do is say, hey, look, we, we look and value skills and techniques that improve function and we evaluate behaviors and postures and habitus by saying that's those you can do and they may or may not cause pain, but they definitely cause compromise in function. Mm. So how do I teach a, you know, if I don't want to have a burst fracture in my T-spine, you know, and be osteoporotic and bend over and have compromised lung function now and a tie down sympathetic chain ganglia, yeah. then maybe I should pay attention to that, that, you know, reading posture yeah. and, you know, put my arms over my head or, you know, and so I, I think we're, we're connecting the dots in a way that we haven't before. And I think we also have a population that is hungry for, 
you know, be, be seeing things that are non-skilled right. and passing off the non-skilled work away and pretending like this, this non-skilled work is part and parcel from physical therapy because it's not. Yeah. You no. Know? Oh my gosh. And that's definitely the case in a lot of settings that, that I've been in. Um, what, what's discouraging to you in our profession? Well, I think like every profession, uh, you know, people we're, we're struggling to find out our own voice and identity. Um, you know, I think we're late to the party in terms of um, how we market ourselves and advocate for ourselves. Um, you know, there are some really smart, bright people out there. And, you know, it, it, unfortunately, social media gives us a tiny glimpse sometimes of how people are thinking. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to be like, you know, try to take someone's legs out. You know, I, I think there's a lot of bitter infighting in physical therapy that's just bullshit. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I really want to, you know, I think we have a chance to say, let's put our money where our mouth is. You know, what are you doing to, to change people's perceptions? Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, for the last, you know, 10 weeks, you know, I volunteer an hour of my day and I go and work, you know, once every Monday I go work with, you know, 40 to 60 girls on, you know, 12 year olds on jumping and landing mechanics, you know, efficiency of the hip, right? Spinal stabilization. And that's called injury prevention training. But if I'm going to take on the fact that women are still tearing their ACLs at six to eight times the rate of men, I better work in my community applying my skill set. And that's really my, my message is one of communitarianism. We need to get involved. If, you, if you're tired of seeing the same patellar tendinopathies and you know, posterior tib tendinitis and Achilles problems, then you, know, you should probably go down to that team in training and lead. Don't just lecture to people, but lead daily programming. Show, you know, create a YouTube channel. Show people how they can take care of themselves and you can be an ally in that front. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of Jeff Moore. I mean, he he is definitely okay. an inspiration to me, just getting after it and just pushing people to get in the community, whether it's on a you know big scale or even that one on one you know interaction. That you know we do have valuable knowledge for the public, and we need to get out and share it. Um, so I want to transition a little bit. I want to be respectful of your time. I'm going to ask just some some quick questions. Your responses don't have to be quick by any means. Um, but the first one, uh, what what kind of car do you drive? That's a good question. My wife, my wife and I have two cars. Okay. We have a, an electric car. All right. We have, we have a BMW i3. Okay. And uh, because we have solar on our roof, and we think it's totally American and punk rock to, <laughs> you know, make our own sun juice and put it in our car. Right. And then we own a diesel truck. I love it. All right. And so we call ourselves carbon neutral, but that <laughs> that, that diesel. You know, is how we move around our big stuff and go to the mountains. Yeah. And but that we, you know, we'll own forever and ever and ever. Right. It's a tra- we, we, I own a tractor and an electric car. Okay, so the tractor. All right, let's say you're a home health physical therapist. You're driving around your big diesel dually around California. It's not a dually. See, see, oh come on, that's not a truck then. So see, you're seeing patients. What would you have in the back of your truck? Oh, what type sim- of equipment? Sandbags. Um, you know, a few, a few dumbbells, some kettlebells, some thera- you know, some, some bands. Um, and, and that's it. it. It's, it's simple. It really, I mean, you, you can get people to the Olympics with a kettlebell. Mm, preach it. Preach it right it, there. No, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't, balls or any of that fun stuff. Well, you know, first things first is I want to have a conversation about moving and moving well. And then the next conversation is, is, um, you know, if, if you are squatting better, then I can tell you you're going to have less hip dysfunction and soft tissue dysfunction. Mm-hmm. So let's get you moving, and then we can have another conversation about how to address your soft tissue dysfunction. And, and you know, 50% of the problems a physician will see in their practice are musculoskeletal, and people have zero, zero understanding of how to address common myofascial dysfunction. And it is very low-hanging fruit to yeah. show someone how they can roll around on a ball or you know, hold, hold a kettlebell on their quads while they're sitting in the wheelchair. You know what I mean? Like yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how, how low that bar is to entry and how, you know, if we give people 10 minutes a day of soft tissue work, they feel massively better and upregulate so much of their function from proprioception onwards, mm. even, even downregulating nociception. Yeah. So, uh, I, I know you get probably lots of stuff mailed to you for you to try out and, you know, 
put out on your social media platforms and whatnot. I know, you know, our buddy Tim DeFrancesco has the same issue working with the Lakers. But out of the things that you get uh, in terms of pieces of, of technology or equipment, which ones have you really excited about their effectiveness and which ones make you think that there's a potential application in older adults? Um, it's interesting. I think uh, the things that we're most excited about right now are showing people how to do some classic gua sha, you know, basic tissue scraping. Yeah. You know, unless, unless people are on just blood thinners and they're paper thin. I mean, I have never seen a, a rubber spatula kill someone. <laughs> and show and showing someone how they can you know put a little put a little lotion on their elbow and just do a little you know scraping of their tissue. I mean, when my wife and I were in Korea teaching, we were in this little traditional section of Korea, and we walked past this this woman in her eighties, and she had a pile of horns and bones on the table. And and I walked up and I was like, Juliet, you know what these are? And she's like, these are dry scraping tools. These are this is you know that's what these are. And I picked them up and kind of scraped myself, and this woman lit up. That this big, you know, bald white guy <laughs> knew what was up, yeah. and she started scraping my neck and rubbing my back, oh, and shoot. you know, and I think I think that has real application for everyone. Showing someone how you know you can imp- cr- Im- increase, you know, what we call our sliding surfaces, you know, how how you restore sliding, how you can you know downregulate a painful area, how can you could you know s- you know scrape uh, to improve proprioception. I mean, it's really low tech and it's old tech. And it turns out that also you don't need a PhD because you've been touching yourself your whole life. And I think that's, that's a miracle. Um, (laughs) We're starting starting to see that move out. Um, I think there's some really interesting application of, of blood flow restriction. Yeah. I was going to mention that. Yeah. BFR for, for perfusion problems. I think, you know, you can do that pretty safely for folks and get a huge bump, you know, in the neuroendocrine system from that, mm-hmm. and resolve some old perfusion problems. You know, um, I think that you know the tech of breathing is really, really there. Um, I would say the other th- interesting thing uh, that we, you know, we don't use a lot of modalities, but we believe strongly in things like the Mark Pro or H Wave. People might know that or Compex. Mm-hmm. These these big muscle contracting neuromuscular tensing devices. We're not using them for pain necessarily, but we have found that we can radically reduce, you know, effusion and some sort of disuse problems if we get those on and pumping, especially after surgeries. And people who don't have high ambulatory capacity, you know, if they're if they are bed bound, boy, you know, I, I did not realize in PT school or as a student in the hospital how important the pneumatic boots were, yeah, or, you know, that yeah. that head hose was such a pain in the ass, but man, it makes a difference. So, you know, if you got people at home wearing compression socks, dude, you're winning, this, you're winning the battle already. Yeah. Yeah. I, when you mentioned when you BFR, just- that that's really got me hyped up. I've been talking with uh, Johnny Owens. He was a, a previous guest on, on the podcast. And my gosh, the implications of that, because I think of all the patients that I have to wear, you know, I, I use a lot of kettlebells and I'll try and do these compound movements. And, you know, some of them, I just can't do that at all. So I have to resort to, you know, maybe even TheraBand or ankle weights or whatever. But man, if I can throw a tourniquet on there safely and still have, you know, the two pound weight on their ankle. I mean, just the results that you can get just from restricting their blood flow is crazy. And the research that they're just starting on that is is going to be amazing, you know, when it gets finished and, and rolled out. So I'm really, well, really and super I, pumped. You know, and you can get an arterial blood, you know, blood pressure, you know, arterial flow monitor for like a hundred bucks, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, and, and it's not even a tourniquet, it's ligature, right? We're slowing, slowing down and that can be done, you know, without these thousand dollar units and very, very safely. And, you know, once again, what we're coming back to is how are we going to improve vascular compliance, yeah. you know, and, and range of motion. Uh, you know, one of the things that my wife and I are huge, huge fans of is we get into the ice tank every day, you know, and <laughs> that's, not ice, that. that's, that's, that's not that's not icing injuries that, you know, <laughs> I mean, for my birthday this year, Juliet had a stainless steel ice tank made for our backyard in the mid century modern ethic. <laughs> and, and, you know, even this morning, you know, we're a little shook up from the election. There's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that ice tank, man, it, it, it sets us right. So what, what you know, but that we're seeing is not only about, you know, breath control, you know, the nerves are the king of the breath. The breath is the king of the brain. 
Mm. And I, I think sometimes we're failing to see those very old relationships that were put forward by people like Iyengar 100 years ago, 60 years ago. Mm. We have cracked some of these things. I, I think if everyone walked 5K a day, man, what you know, we would see so many fewer problems going out there. So yeah. any time where I can improve how the body is supposed to function with an additional – you know, low tech, scalable intervention. I'm on board. Yeah, I agree. All right. So last question, my favorite question. Let's say, let's say we're at CSM combined sections meeting for all the PTs. You are in the big auditorium. There are all the geriatric rehab clinicians in the room. You've got a captive audience for 30 to 60 seconds. What would you want them to know? Uh, that, you know, <laughs> good Lord, that, uh, <laughs> I don't even know where to start on that, that, uh, you know, one high fives all around awesome. because, you know, at some point I think we forget that everyone ages up, you know, and as you and I said even beforehand, if you don't, if you're not interested in working with this population, you will. Yeah. And, and if you can't scale your thinking from children to people who, you know, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, then you have a hole in your thinking. Mm. And, one of the most important things that I think I would tell the people is the same thing I would tell the young coaches. So one of my greatest influences, a guy named Mike Bergner, who is an Olympic lifting coach and an Olympic, uh, Olympic coach. And one of the things that he did, even though he had children who've gone to the Olympics and, you know, and he's coached the world's best athletes, is he ran a high school strength and conditioning program where he taught 14-year-old kids to Olympic lift for nearly 15 to 20 years. And because of that, he saw what worked, what didn't work, what was universal, what scaled up. And what I what I always tell people is make sure that you're working with lots of different populations so that you can understand how your thinking scales and to scale it up and scale it down. And mm, because he worked with 14-year-olds, he was better equipped to work with 22-year-old Olympians. And what I would tell the people who are working in this field is do the same thing. Make sure that you're also living in a high performance world because in that high performance world, we're, we're learning a lot about the upper levels of function and there's a lot to be stolen and borrowed and applied. So, you know, keep your eye and it's difficult to do, you know, it's difficult to be so immersed in your field and then look around and be like, well, what are these other people doing? You know? Yeah. And, um, and I think that there's, there is some very interesting things that we could do to, again, change or even improve the practice or improve efficiency or, or support if we looked around a little bit, you know? Yeah. And, you know, just to, to wrap things up, I think, honestly, the easiest way for listeners to do that would just be to follow you online, your YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook, all those different avenues, because I know for me, uh, that's been huge kind of in my home health silo, being able to, to see how you think and the Mike Reynolds and Tim DeFrancesco's and all these other great PTs that are in a whole other world than what I, I'm in, that there are things that are scalable and I can apply them to my patients in a, a safe and a, a thoughtful manner. So let's uh, give me the, the place where you would want people to reach out to you or kind of see uh, the work that you're up to on the interwebs. Well, our, our, our handle is mobility. W-O-D, work out of the day, which is the idea of trying to remind people that, you know, you have to have a physical practice and put some soft tissue health into yourself a little bit every day. Um, we're at mobilitywad.com. If you want to come over, we have, a, we have a, about 2,200 videos. You can see how we program daily mobility wor workouts or mo daily mobility sessions because we have a follow along, you know, video that we do every day. Um, you know, that's, you can deep dive into that ocean and, and get lost in there. But, uh, we have a 10 day trial where you can, you know, circle around and see how we're thinking and the people we're interviewing with. And, you know, and we're, we're lucky that we get to touch a lot of people and see around a lot of corners, mm. which means that we get a lot of experience because we see everyone's dirty laundry. And let me just give you a last example. You know, our gym is at San Francisco CrossFit and we always tell any physio, you're welcome to come hang out with us anytime and see how we actually apply the principles of physiology, the principles of physical, you know, of physical therapy to actual movements mm. and, you know, actual training well people, because it's important that we understand that. But, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, we have a huge University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, their 
adaptive program and their prosthetics department is coming to San Francisco CrossFit and working with our staff. And, and we're doing a, a large demonstration workshop community event for all of the, you know, amputees, you know, wheelchair athletes, adaptive athletes in the area. Awesome. And, and all you have to do is be like, oh, these guys work with Olympians. They have to also be able to speak this language. Oh, they have a master's program and a kid's program. Mm. I can see how they think about solving these problems because if we only see a little slice, again, sometimes that colors are what we think is possible. Yeah. That's awesome. Preach it, man. I want to thank you for, for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for, you know, the work that you do, just putting out the content, but most importantly, thank you for your wisdom and insight into my marriage with my wife. So I I know (laughs) that was your intention with the book. So (laughs) it was, well, Dustin, thank you so much. And thanks for holding the space. And you know, what's so great about our field is, you know, so many people are working towards the same ends. Mm -hmm. And what I feel like is, you're coming from this side. I'm coming from this side. You know, um, you know, Sandy, the public floor, you know, I mean, there's so many people working on the same sets of problems. We're all going to meet in the middle because all roads lead to Rome. My last piece of advice for people listening is don't kick the, the men and women whose shoulders you're standing on. You know, we, people are making decisions and w- the reason we are where we are today is because, you know, physios and coaches have been holding the doors for us. Preach it. Thank you, sir. All right, folks, mobilitywide.com. Check them out. And until next time, do not forget to stay funky.